it is time once again for the Real People Multigame Solitaire Mega Tournament. As part of our careers framework, I guess, we are doing the teaching, the first teaching job, um, where we have five teachers. Uh, teachers in careers are the same as sailors, so we're doing a boat game. This boat game, however, is not as dull as many because it kind of uh, flows through, so to speak, the, all the boat aspects. So we have a map here, as you can see, um, but the boats don't actually sit on the map. The only thing that really sits on the map are the colonies. So colonies, those are, those are fine. Um, it's probably pretty exciting to be in a colony. Um, the boats, when they do move, they just kind of basically just kind of say what route they're going to go on and then they head back to Europe. So they just go whoop, they come in on this entry arrow, arrow and they don't really even have to say their route in, uh, unless someone's a pirate. Now there's a good chance some people are going to be pirates. Um, let's take a look at, at some more of the game. The, uh, a lot of the game is going to be played on these um, player mats here. Everyone has their player mat where they, they put the units they have. Everyone starts with one unit and two players, in this case, because I'm using an optional rule, start with what's called a Mordita card. Um, the units go are of one of three sizes and they can grow and shrink, I think. Um, and they consist of either colonies or boatsmen. The colonies are, they're, they're interested in boatsmen coming to trade with them. They're like the flowers. The boatsmen are interested in going and getting money by by trading. The goal of the game is to get money. Um, so they're like bees. Now, this is the money here. You're supposed to use pennies. I didn't have enough, so I'm using these chips. Um, but it's probably advisable to use pennies if you have them, because you're also going to want to be able to fit these treasure tents on there. Now, one player is very special, and that's Vaughn in this case. She is the Marquis de Guadalcazar. And what she does is she gets to designate the treasure flota. Flota? 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 It's flota, right? Treasure flota. Yes. I always want to say like flotilla or flotilla, uh, but it's flota, um, which I think means treasure float. Um, which in the, the main game sails once a decade. So we see this calendar here, it's 10 years, halfway through about the flota sails. Um, and each treasure then is worth 25, 25 bucks. These are bucks, that's a lot. Now you can't use that money during the game, but it's worth points at the end. So getting those is, a, is, is helpful for victory. I'm however using the optional rule where they sail instead three times a year during the years where there's a parrot. You see these little parrots here? And instead of wor being worth 25, they're worth 10. Um, I, I, someone recommended that, and I have enjoyed playing that way in the past. It makes a little more dynamic. Another um, optional rule is, and I'm gonna use this optional rule, um, on the treasure years, which are the parrot years, the treasures show up here on the, 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 the cities with the boats, okay? And here you might think these are boats in the water, but they're not, they're just a, an icon. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and so people can go to those cities and try and take the treasure before the flota sets sail. The flota goes off at the very end of the turn. So that's, that's another fun dynamic. So Vaughn's going to get to designate who's in the flota, and they have some binding deal as to how the treasure gets divvied up. Now, it's the only time a deal is binding in the game, which uh, makes for, it's at its heart, a negotiation game with some randomized elements and some historical flavor. Um, most deals are not binding except for this particular treasure flota deal. So... As you can see, the map, it's mainly just to plan routes because if someone's a pirate and, you know, you can have a unit that's not a pirate, like this unit, or a unit that's a pirate, which you would put a pirate token on the unit to make them a pirate. Basically, pirates can attack anyone, but they can also be attacked by anyone. As it is, unless they're at war, our boatsmen can't attack each other because right now they're all merchants. Um, another optional rule I'm playing with is we're playing with... Uh, King Ganga Zumba. 
And I like using King Ganga Zumba because it creates uh, more of a, a dynamic trade environment when you start off. So normally you start off with just one colony who's also the person who designates the, the flota, um, Marquis de Guadalcolzar. Um, which is which makes for an interesting game because the marquee is very important. Every all the, all the other bees are going to want to trade with that flower, but only three of them can on a given turn, at least when the game starts. And so someone gets left out, and that person is likely going to become a pirate. It leads to piracy sooner, I think. Um, with Ganga Zumba in play, but all the while the marquee is getting a lot of money. You know, they they start off in a very powerful position until people decide to kind of gang up. So there's that kind of story. With Ganga Zumba, it's a little more dynamic because there's two people to trade with. Um, and so, you know, as you can see, each each of these boats can trade with one colony per turn. They're going to bring back a dollar each. Okay, as it was before, the marquee would get three bucks a turn, you know, before more cards come out and change the situation. And someone else would get none. So now... One of these two colonies is going to get two, probably, unless they can cut some deal. and Or th or I guess they could get three. One could get all three, and the other one could be could be shut out. So it's, it, it makes for an interesting position um, to me. All right, so I'm talking a lot about some other stuff in the game. We have two colony people, King Ganga Zuma and Marquis de Guadalcazar, and three bumblebees, Cowboy Brezza and Otto. Otto's playing the part of Duke James Ket... Yeah, I, guess I keep wanting to say Kepler, but it's not. Kettler. And El Draco, Sir Francis Drake, as cowboy. The Broke. And we have Buccaneer Jean Le Vasseur, Brethren of the Coast, is Brezza. Um, makes sense. He was in the French leg. I didn't even think about that. All right. Um, so what do you do on a turn? First thing you do... Is you reveal a card, and we already revealed a card this turn. It was this one. Then you resolve the black spot, which is the random event for the turn. All right. Or there's actually cards that have events on them as well, but it's kind of a more regular random event. This was malaria. Malaria doesn't affect anyone. Normally it affects heathen colonies, but there's special rules for King Ganga Zumba. Um, then people capitalize their cards. So this was here. If this was here at the start of the turn, which it wasn't, um, Cowboy would have to pay a buck. So basically anything, everything you have on your track that you haven't built yet, because these are things you're working on, costs you a dollar, um, which is one of your chips. Um, so you do that. You can do Skullduggery. Skullduggery is on these Mordita cards here. You see these dots? These dots are the cost. More dots, the more it costs. If it has a star right there, it disrupts the card. And when a card's disrupted, it goes into the Mercenary deck and can then be auctioned off. So we have, then we go to C3, where we auction cards and resolve any events that got drawn. So we already did our auction here. Um, auctioning, I don't like really enjoy doing in multiplayer games. I don't really enjoy it so much in um, games I play with other humans. I meant to say I don't enjoy it in multiplayer solitaire games. Um, Origins, which uh, Phil Eklund likes to use auctions a lot. In Origins, it's the easiest for me because it just seems like it's, uh, I don't know, it seems kind of like there's, it's, the, the choice isn't that hard <laughs> to make. In this, where it's kind of a more nebulous sum, and I don't know the game well enough to really know how much money's worth so well, um, it's just kind of, it's totally up in the air, which I, I think Eklund probably likes. Um, harder to make choices, though, especially with the, the data on the back. It was e kind of easy in this situation, though, because I knew Cowboy was a big spender, so he just spent all his money, got the first colony. That's going to, you know, it's nice to have a colony, um, and that's going to definitely change the dynamic between these two, because then we'll have three colonies. His colony is only going to be uh, size one, though, so that's one thing. And it's going to take a couple years if he gets the money to pay for it. So he's going to pretty much just be paying for that for the next couple turns. All right, then people do their movement. Um, and you don't even have to plot out your movement unless you uh, unless there's pirates, like I said. Um, this is also the phase, we're on C4 right now, where people decide if they're pirates or not, and they can uh, fight each other, that kind of thing. And then 
you initiate upgrades and oh yeah so you can you can buy forts and mills which are upgrades for your colonies and and then you mature cards if your if your thing is on the thing on, on there then you advance the turn markers so when when this gets to here cowboy will have to pay for it um, you have to pay for it each turn right when it gets there at the at uh, c5 then he can bring it out and he'll put it here and he'll have his colony and then you advance the turn marker to a new year and you start it all again. Okie doo, our first turn is done. Let's go over how people traded. Not, I mean, not huge, huge stuff, but still interesting. Uh, Otto and Brezza both traded with Vaughn. So she pulled in two that turn. Uh, that they're trying to kind of getting good with her so that they can become a part of the treasure float later on. Uh, and I left Cowboy to trade with Demi. He could have traded with Vaughn as well, but he didn't really want her to have all the power. Uh, Cowboy likes, he doesn't like big shots so much. Um, and that's pretty much all that happened. So now let, oh, and Vaughn is going to construct a mill. That's going to actually make for an interesting situation later because um, Demi, as King Gangazuma, has the the ability to destroy mills. So if she wants to keep that mill and which doubles her profits, she's gonna have to get a give a kickback to Demi. Um, but they'll they'll discuss that later. Let's see what our next card is. Okay, so that's mutiny. Each privateer and pirate loses a soldier. No one bought any soldiers. No one thought they were gonna get attacked. And so that's not gonna do anything. Then we have Marine de las Alas. Audencia de Nueva Granada. And that's an interesting Mordita card. Okay, Accusation Recall to disrupt, disrupt a Spanish unit. So that could be problematic to Vaughn, though the cost of disrupting the unit is going to be far greater than the cost of um, to her for getting it back. An extra treasure tent in Cartagena next treasure year. Ooh. And pillage and sack. Arabuca. Oh, that's pretty good, too. All right, we'll see how they vote. Or how they bid. I, ne I, ne I, ne 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 I neglected to say the mutiny also moved all of these immature things one year forward. So it made it. It makes it so they're going to have to pay more to eventually get what they want. Um, this card's pretty interesting. The smuggling makes it interesting in this situation. Um, there's the the threat to disrupt Spanish car units, right? There's the extra treasure tent. Um, Let's them pillage this if someone get if that colony even comes up. Um, but the smuggling makes it so that people trade with Cartagena. Cartagena. Um, I'm kind of stuck a little bit on this. I'm gonna just kind of make a ruling. Normally, smuggling only relates to things that are red. Cartagena is not red. It's a it's a treasure treasure town. Um, but I guess it kind of makes it a de facto colony there. Now, Vaughn right now, especially since she's going to have her mill going, she wants people to be trading here. She doesn't want people to trade with this one. So if someone else gets this, they can um, then trade with Cartagena instead, and won't she won't get the extra profit. So once her mill's in play, she gets two for each each time someone trades with her. So I think she's going to bid pretty high to get this. Uh, I still kind of haven't worked out all the bidding. I mean, we have Otto and Brezza who are still trying to get on her good side, but Demi definitely doesn't feel like he needs to do that. So he'll probably be bidding her up. Cowboy can't bid, which is nice. Don't I mean, not nice for him, but we don't have to think about that. Um, so let me mull this over. Vaughn took it for four. Again, she wins ties because of her religious affiliation with the card, that's gonna, she, her Mordita slots are both filled now, so that's gonna limit her in the future. Uh, she's, she should have no trouble getting more money. Uh, Demi didn't wanna go higher than that. He would've pretty much had nothing left, and he's not assured that Cowboy's gonna continue to trade with him. The other two seem to be vying for Vaughn's affections. Uh, we'll go through and do our trading again. It's probably gonna shake out the same as last turn, I imagine. Otto's picking up this next one for three. The black spot did nothing. So he has another buddy, another bee in his hive. 
uh, he won ties on that, which Demi was bidding against him. Demi would have liked a dedicated merchant to, to help increase his profits, but Demi's, Demi doesn't want to use more than three on that. Uh, so there we go. Because I've been using Vaughn as sort of my my own calendar for the game, I and her real people card is covering up the parrot. I missed the parrot year, so we're gonna have this this monkey year, and monkeys are fine too, be the treasure year, um, and and there we go. So we have our treasure tents out, and we have a new person on the field. It's Edward Mansfeld of Rotterdam, the pirate warlord. Uh, good pirate, help people trade more. Uh, so it's probably going to be in some high demand. Oh, we had this event here. I forgot to mention that. The plague happened, and that's pretty big. That that moved all the, the largest colonies down to size one. Now that is going to make it so that there's a lot less to trade with, right? We only have two potential colonies to trade with, so someone's probably going to turn pirate this turn. And then we also have added to that the whole thing with assigning the treasure fleet. This is a big turn. Um, the pirate warlord is going to be coveted, but money is going to be more scarce because people aren't assured to be able the, the ability to trade. So Vaughn is designating the treasure float. As she is going to actually allow everyone to share in the treasure. And the idea is that they'll each get one tent and... Pretty much what that does is that just puts Demi down by 10 points. Uh, everyone agrees to that, and so that is how the treasure float is going to be this turn. Demi doesn't have anything that can intercede with that, although the others could. No, I think if they're part of the float, I don't think they can attack to try and steal more treasure. And so there we go. Brez is seizing on the opportunity. Um, of Otto's depleted resources. He's offering Vaughn seven in order to make his his ship, his fleet size go up one. What that's gonna do is that's gonna allow Vaughn a trading partner, because he's also gonna guarantee he trades with her. Um, nor, you know, since all the ships are size one right now and they're all picking up treasure, no one's gonna be able to trade with Vaughn or Demi this turn. Um, so he's going to trade with her, so she's going to get another one, and he's going to get another one, and he's going to give her one for profit. In case you don't know, the Casa de la Contracción card allows Vaughn to up someone's fleet at the cost of six. So I think she's going to accept that. She's going to, and then she's going to spend six right now in order to up the Brethren of the Coast up to size two. And... Um, that's it. <laughs> that brings us to the auction phase. Otto's going to bid four before anyone can say anything, uh, since there's no tie breaking or anything like that. So whoever gets to four first, which is, I think, the maximum that the the three kind of competent bidders have, uh, gets it. And so he did it. He jumped on it. He's going to have this pirate warlord. It's going to come in to play at the end at, at C5. So the rest of the turn is going to just kind of play out as they plan. There's not going to be any, any real thing to happen. Everyone's going to get their treasure card. There's no pirates or anything or their treasure tent except for Demi. And we see how it all shakes out here. Um, we've got Brezza with the size two fleet. We've got Cowboy who's going to be getting his colony right now, actually, at the end of this turn. We have Demi who has his one colony with three armies. And we have Otto who has his Latvian families who are going to be coming into play next turn. And then we have our treasure player who's sitting on... She's the she's the winner. She's the leader right now. If they decided to end the game at this point, she would win at 14 points. Um, she has her mill coming in, and that's going to do it for this episode of the Real People Multi Game Solitaire Mega Tournament, Lords of the Spanish Main.